Welcome to More Than Words, a podcast about treating the whole child brought to you by the Reading and Language Learning Center. I'm your host, Tristan, and today I'm joined by the Executive Director of Sliding Doors, Krista Gothier, to discuss dyslexia and STEM. Hi, Krista. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Tristan? I'm doing wonderful. We're really excited to have you here. And I'm just going to have you start by introducing yourself. Who are you? What do you do? And everything in between. (laughs) Great, great place to start. Uh, first, just thank you um, for having me on your podcast. I was really, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, as you said, my name is Krista Gothier. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of an organization called Sliding Doors STEM and Dyslexia Learning Center. We also go by the name Dyslexic Edge as well. Um, and basically, um, this whole thing started because I'm a parent of a, a child with dyslexia, and um, in in taking that journey with her. Um, we, you know, I learned a lot as a parent, but two things that stood out that really led to sliding doors and what I do now is, is that, um, we realized it's very expensive and hard to access help for students with dyslexia. Mm. Um, but also too, that these children are very gifted in, in STEM. And so we wanted to create, um, an organization that educated the whole child, Um, And so when I founded Sliding Doors, uh, the idea was to not only educate that whole child, but to create a nonprofit so that we could um, get funding to help students who have no access to their socioeconomic status um, to the help they need. So that's what I do now. I actually have a background, though, in education. I was an English teacher for a number of years. I um, actually also um, have done graduate work in educational research at the University of Colorado Boulder um, and have also been a development director for a private school. So I sort of took all those pieces and united it under my executive director position of sliding doors. Wow. That's awesome. That sounds like something that you can bring a lot of passion to. So that sounds like a very, very exciting um, and really powerful thing that you're doing. Um, So You said you're executive director of Sliding Doors and where is that? And if people were like going to go look for you guys online, like where would they find you? Sure, absolutely. So we're based in the Northern Virginia area, uh, just just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, We have both... um, we have um, site locations. So we um, we have a site at St. Bernadette School in Springfield. Um, we also have a Title I program in Arlington, which I'll talk about later. Um, but we also have a private network. So we have a network of tutors that, that can provide services to students all over the Northern Virginia region. Um, and we even have some students who do remotely that are outside the region. Um, to find us, we actually, our website um, is sdsquared.org. So it's S-D-S-Q-U-A-R-E-D.org. Um, I'm also reachable through my email, which is Krista at SD squared. So Krista, K-R-I-S-T-A at SD squared. So that's how you would locate us. Um, or if you just Google dyslexia and STEM, we actually pop up pretty quickly. So you Perfect. can do it that way too. Okay. So Awesome. Well, I'll link, um, I'll link everything in the show notes so people can find you guys. Great. Awesome. Well, let's just hop right into it. So for those who maybe don't know, can you tell us what the acronym STEM actually stands for? Sure. Absolutely. I, I, it stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Okay. And why did you, I mean, I think you kind of hit on this, but why did you really decide to focus on STEM with individuals with dyslexia? You mentioned your daughter. Right. So um, the reason is, is like I said, when we did a whole bunch of research, when we first uh, realized that our daughter um, has dyslexia, we, we started to come across all of these articles and research studies about, you know, the strengths of dyslexia, right? So people with dyslexia tend to be, you know, really good with visual spatial 3d thinking, and it, and it tends to, um, make them very well suited for careers in STEM. Um, and so funny enough, my husband, who's an engineer said, maybe I can't ever get engineers because the kids who would become engineers never get to me. Um, Mm -hmm. and so, we again then started doing more and more research and we realized that, you know, so many kids are disadvantaged so early on um, that they never can get on that STEM pathway. And so um, we, um, we really wanted to then not only make sure that they could access those future careers, but also play on their strengths very much in the early ages or the early grades, because not only do these kids need reading intervention to make sure that they can you know, access curriculum and to read at grade level, but 
they also spend so much time in the early grades on reading that these kids generally don't have access to subjects where they excel. And so what ends up happening is, is these students artificially start to believe, right, that falsely believe that they aren't learners, that they can't do well in school, right? And so, you know, for us, the STEM piece is not only let's expose them to future careers, but it's also let's bring in a bunch of subjects where they can excel and then their confidence, right, increases and it keeps them on the path of learning. It shows them they can be lifelong learners um, and, it, and it really, it sets them up for success. And so we think of STEM as not only just those four subjects, but also in a kind of a meta way where it's like, not only are we, um, you know, exposing them to these subjects, but we're also showing them where their strengths lie and also teaching them a great way to approach the world. STEM yeah. has a, a lot of those subjects really allow for exploration of the world around you, asking those questions of what and the how and the why and the, you know, and, and critical thinking and all those great skills as well. So that, that's why we focus on STEM. Very cool. So you'd mentioned that it starts at kind of like an early age that students feel like they can't succeed in school, which leads to, you know, not having the opportunities. So what happens as kids grow up that you're that you've maybe seen and they're starting to look for employment and at an early age they were disadvantaged from being able to reach those stem opportunities what do you see happen to those kids so so what we do what we've discovered is is, is something that we actually call the barbell problem right so when we think about um when we think about outcomes right when you when you look at you know career you know out, career outcomes and things of that sort those of us who are neurotypical, you know, we tend to fall on that bell curve, right? We're all sort of lumped in the middle, right? Most right. of us are average, right? You know, <laughs> we may be a little bit above or below, but we're all average right? in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the, the careers we pursue and things of that sort. What happens with students with dyslexia, which is interesting, is that it ends up more as a barbell in terms of outcomes. So you see, like, for example, on one side, you've got these amazing statistics. So when you think about the fact that dyslexia affects about 15 to 20% of the population, right? When you look at statistics of how many engineers and self-made millionaires and entrepreneurs are dyslexic, it's higher than that, right? So you see like 35% of engineers are dyslexic or 40% wow. of self-made millionaires, right? Uh, MIT even calls it the MIT disease because so many <laughs> people at MIT have dyslexia, right? Wow. So you go, okay, so obviously there's these, they all possess these really amazing skills that allow right. them to have these great outcomes. But on the other side of this barbell, you have 48% of the prison population that's dyslexic. Oh, wow. So you, so you sit there and you say, well, what's going wrong? Something right. is breaking down, right. That's causing this hugely disparate set of outcomes for, for people with dyslexia. So, um, so what we see is, is not only is it, do they not pursue these, these, these STEM careers, but they can even end up on paths that lead to drop out, you know, dropping out of school, mm -hmm. possibly even, you know, onto the prison pathway, which is, it's, it's, it's very tragic actually. Right. So, yeah. so that's, that's what we've seen in the research. Really interesting. So what you're doing is basically trying to eliminate that barbell, right? That's exactly what we're trying to do. And in fact, one of the things that we show when we when we can show a graphic, right, is that not only do we want to make it more of a bell curve, we actually want to like shift it all like mostly over right to that sort of side of the engineers, the MIT right. grads and whatever, because a lot of these students with dyslexia have above average intelligence. If you gave them the access and the ability to achieve their full potential, they could knock the ball out of the park. And so, right. you know, not only are we trying to like eliminate the barbell, we're trying to even make it. So it's not even a bell curve. Like we want to right. see that whole, whole thing shift. Right. So yeah, that's awesome. So what types of programs do you offer um, to the students when they come to you? And do they get to pick like an area of focus? Do they get to pick like what they're most excited about? So, uh, yes, actually. But um, I'll start with like what we offer in terms of programming. Yeah. So um, we do start with the early, early grades. So we really see this as a long term play We're, we, when we talk even with potential sponsors and companies and things of like that we talk about what we call the kindergarten to workforce pathway, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've got to start them in the early grades. So mm -hmm. our, our interventions tend to be for, for grades one through five. Generally, we do have some older kids, but 
Um, our core mission or our core programming is our after school programming. Uh, when we launched in January of 2017, we we began with five intrepid families and students who took a chance on us. But uh, but that after school program um, provides it meets twice a week and it provides both the reading intervention. So we have an Orton Gillingham based curriculum that we use, um, and uh, the students get one on one 45 minutes of tutoring. But then they also get 45 minutes of STEM enrichment. Okay, right. So we so we have both. The, the interesting outcome of that is, is that um, we just always knew we wanted to put the two together just so they could have both. But what we've seen is, is that this sort of indirect impact of like now they're doing something where they, something they love was something that's a little bit of a challenge, right? And mm. they start to associate the two, which is really fascinating. So they mm. don't say we hate the reading and love the STEM. We say, they say we love sliding doors, right? So they're starting mm. to connect these things. Um, and one of the things that we're most excited about um, is that we've always, our intention has always been that we wanted to provide our two-year program at no charge to kids in Title I schools. Wow. And it's taken a long time <laughs> to do that, but we finally got to a place with our partners. We're partnered with Virginia Tech and the NAACP and Arlington schools. And we're finally, wow. we were finally able to um, start a title one program in October at Drew elementary in Arlington, um, where we have students who do get our full services at no charge, thanks to the generosity of sponsors and donors and things of that sort. So that's always been our core mission. We also do do some private tutoring as well. So we um, actually have a private tutoring network of about 20 tutors that also can provide services. So, um, that's um, and in terms of you asked me one other question. I'm sorry. It was no, that's okay. Um, oh, can they pick a specialty area? Yeah. So, um, yes, but in a very informal way, right? These okay. are young kids. So one of the things that we do try to do though is um, because it's two years, and we have the ability to sort of really dive into what interests these kids. It, it, mm-hmm. We tend to do things that are easily accessible in STEM right? Early on kitchen chemistry. We always start with that. Kids love getting messy. They love, you know, they love making slime and, you know, and making volcanoes and all those kinds of things. But what we do is, is we start to really observe and take notes and sort of grab it or try to lean towards what the kids are showing interest in. So, you know, they're young, so they don't pick a specialty, but like I said, we do really try to tune into what is going to capture their interests and, and their passions. Yeah. Very cool. So another thing that is kind of interesting that might, or might, might be going, veering off a little, but a lot of children with dyslexia often have ADHD, right? Um, And they often excel in STEM programs too, but do you have any like personal experience with this? Have you seen any kids that come in with ADHD and dyslexia, and then you see these amazing things they do? Like, what have you seen? Uh, yes, for sure. Um, in fact, um, we've had over a hundred students participate in our programming in one form or another. And I would say, um, that of the hundred kids, I can probably think of two that have what I would, would say is just dyslexia, right? Like a lot of our students come to us and have other, you know, processing ADHD, anxiety, you know, um, other comorbid conditions that tend to, um, come with dyslexia. Um, and in terms of, you know, one of the things that, and I do a lot of workshops for teachers too. And I bring that up because when I talk about how do you teach for neurodiversity, right. Which, you know, a lot of the things you do tends to um, work with a bunch of this, a bunch Mm -hmm. of these different challenges. One of the things that I really try to stress with teachers is, is that, you know, frequently changing activities as well as, um, project-based learning is huge for okay. these kids. And so what we see with kids, you ask, what, what do we see with kids with ADHD and dyslexia? When you have this more project-based learning model and you're really doing the hands-on stuff, they blow me away every single time we do stuff. I'm neurotypical. I don't, I, you know, I don't have dyslexia. I don't have ADHD. And they always exceed my expectations in terms of when I give them a project to do. Yeah. Um, it's, I'll, I'll give you an example. So Every Pi Day, you know, through March 14th, Mm -hmm. um, we do an activity where kids take huge graph paper and they graph the number Pi, right? Now I'm a linear thinker, right? I'm neurotypical. I, when I think of a graph, I think of it straight across the bottom, right? Like left to right, you know, whatever. 
every time I give this project to these kids, they take this and, and they make it almost 3D. They'll like, oh. they'll graph it correctly. But what they'll do is, is they'll take the bars of the graph and mm-hmm. they will actually move them around to make all these different geometric designs. And it's it, the, the way they think is so mind blowing. And I, yeah. and every, every time they create, I'm just, they impress me and blow me away every oh. single day. That so. is so cool. Wow. So the creativity you see like all the time, it's just a lot of creativity in that space, I assume. It's a lot of creativity. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things if I could really, when I talk with educators, that's one of the things that I always say, like a lot of us who go into teaching are more neurotypical school tended to be a very friendly place for us. Mm -hmm. Right. So we tend to default right to very traditional assessment models or lesson planning. Right. And so we tend to shy away from getting a little bit more creative. And what I always say to educators is, is like, you will never go back. Like if you just take that little bit of effort to change your lesson planning or your assessment model to, to include these, these kinds of projects or hands-on activities, you will be so inspired by what these kids create that you will never go back. Wow. Um, And it's just, it's incredible. Oh, that sounds like a, like a fantastic place to be just to um, really get to see those students shine, um, the way that they like should be able to in a typical class setting, but they don't often get that. So that's awesome. Um, I think that was my last question for you, but do you have anything else you want to add? Um, not really. I mean, the only thing I would say is, is, um, you know, is, is to kind of piggyback off of what I just said, which is, and, and kind of a message also to parents um, that we also like to give, which is, you know, one of the things, and I can speak to this as a parent um, and not just the director of sliding doors, which is when you're taking this journey with your child and, and you're at the start of this journey, it is so overwhelming. <clears throat> it's so overwhelming and there's so much to learn. And, and you also are in some ways, mourning the vision and the image you had of your child's future, right? So there's this mm. moment where you, um, you you really have to let go um, and give yourself the time. You need to go through that time of being upset or being sad or being angry. But once you do, like the one thing I would say to educators, to parents, um, is that when you let go and you allow them, when, when your only hope for them is for them to be happy, Right that what ends up happening is they end up showing you a side of the world that you didn't even know existed. Yeah. And it's like, and give yourself the opportunity to enjoy that journey as frustrating as the journey can be, allow that time and space to just champion and to, and enjoy just the unbelievable um, imagination and creativity and, and future that these kids have if they're given what they need. And I just would encourage everybody to just really, really do that and embrace just how special these kids are. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And well, now I have another question for you, which is, um, the parents that you do have that come to sliding doors, what is the thing that they say the most as their kids going through the process? Um, Wow. I mean, they say a lot. I'm um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've heard a lot, um, but I mean, the, the one common thread is, and, and it comes in a variety of questions and concerns, but I would say the thread is, will my child be okay? Mm. Um, and because that that's, what's motivating any question, right. right? Like any question I get or any concern or any challenge or any, you know, that's, that's where that's, that's the root. Right. right. Is my child going to be okay? That's, that's what you're worried about. And, you know, the answer to that is yes, it's going to, and you're, but there's going to be days where you're going to feel like maybe not, and there's right. going to be days where it's going to be two steps back and there's, you know, and it's never a straight line. And um, I always just say to parents, like, yes, they will be okay. Mm-hmm. Let them be them. Right. Right. Don't, you know, don't put them in a box and let them get the help they need, but then, and to just be a parent, that's mm-hmm. one of the things too, especially in Northern Virginia, <laughs> those of us who live here, you know, we're all, we're all type A people um, and we all want to fix and we all want to solve right. and we all, you know, and so a lot of times with parents too, I just say, just be their parent. Yeah. 
you know, be the, be, go kick the soccer ball with them in the backyard, go take a walk, go, you know, play a game, leave the stuff to us, leave the reading and all that to us. We'll, we'll help. Right. We'll, we'll take that piece, just love them and care for them and fight for them and hug them and play with them. And, and that's, that's how I generally answer all of those questions that kind of come (laughs) under that umbrella. Yes. (laughs) So absolutely. Do you see like after uh, like a year or two in that parents start to kind of relax after they see what's working for their kid? They do. I think um, they do. I think the initial, you know, and I have to think back, it was a number of years ago, but um, the initial time is so it really is overwhelming and it's, and you really are panicked um, because, and it's just, all the, the battles with, you know, getting the testing or getting the interventions or getting, you know, is, is hard. And I do think that once they join a program like ours or, you know, any, you know, dyslexia intervention program, they do start to relax because yeah. now, now there's a lifeline, mm-hmm. right? And one of the things we try to do as an organization for parents too, is to be not just a lifeline, but a community. Mm-hmm. So we do do parent workshops. We do, <clears throat> um, our monthly science Saturdays where we all get together as a group and we do like, we go to a fun museum or we go, you know, just so people can have that connection. And so I think what, you know, what happens in our program is that connection is what relaxes them too, right? They're Um, not alone. Yeah. They can talk with other parents who've been on this journey because you feel super isolated. Yeah. Right. As a parent. And so I think that's part of where they start to relax too. I think they're, they're seeing their children succeed, um, they're able to talk openly with other mm-hmm. parents who get it. Um, and so we do see that. And then we're really, um, we really work with them to when they finish to try to support, um, and we're, we're growing our curriculum to include other things other than OG. So we can continue to support, um, beyond, um, beyond just the reading, right. um, because they need it. Yeah. So Okay. That, I think that really was my last question for you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, this has been wonderful. It's, it's good to hear. Cause I think that parents that find out their child has dyslexia, they may not know that STEM could be the thing their kid is interested in. So mm-hmm. this is a fantastic discussion that we had. And I really appreciate you being here. Uh, well, thank you for having me. This has been wonderful. Yeah, no problem. And thanks to the audience for listening. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss miss an episode and we'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your day.